into their wedding chamber, their, their first night together. And he says in Song of Solomon chapter 4, verses 1, I'm sorry, let's pray first. Can I pray first? Let's pray first. <laughs> Father, you are good, and everything you create is good, and you are glorified through your creation as we enjoy what you have created. And we turn our eyes to you, the, the creator and sustainer of us, the author of our faith. And we want to glorify you this morning through what you have written, and we want to glorify you tomorrow through how you have designed us to be. Lord, teach us what it means to glorify you, to not have our own desires leading us, but your desires. Father, as I'm up here, I ask that I would decrease and that you would increase. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Thanks, Father. Amen. All right, Song of Solomon, wedding chamber, with his new bride. He says, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn coming up from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of a warrior. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. You thought I was going to make you blush before. Hold on for the ride. This is the wedding night. They have made their vows before the justice of the peace, if you will, before the priest. All the, everyone around has said, yes, okay, you're married. We say it's good. I can't advance my slide because this is not on. There we go. Wedding night, exposition, Song of Solomon 417. Okay. Wedding night, they've made their vows, they've feasted with their friends, now they're in their private room, and King Solomon is undressing his bride. And as he undresses her, he is admiring her beauty. He starts at the top, reflecting on her eyes and her hair and her teeth, using language of the time that shows beauty and worth. It was common phrases of beauty and worth. He talks about the lips, the temples, the neck, showing that no part of her is too small to be valued and cherished. He delights in her breasts and continues down her body, finishing with what he terms as the mountain of myrrh and the hill of incense. Describes and admires her entire body from top to bottom. His time with her, though, was more than just lustfully enjoying her body, which has its role. God designed us to enjoy each other's bodies, the nakedness of each other's bodies, and it's a great thing. I taught staff training last week, and one of the lessons I was, I preached seven times during the week, so I'm kind of tired. But one of the lessons I preached was on modesty, and, and, and Shannon had no idea what hit him. He had called me to preach on modesty when I was going through Song of Solomon. That was his problem, his fault. But I got to describe and tell these kids, teens, who were about, you know, modesty is a great thing, but also God designed us to be modest so that we can glorify him by being immodest together as husband and wife. And the glory is of that. God designed us to come together as husband and wife, take our clothes off, and enjoy what God created to stand there with nothing on and say, I am beautiful because God made me this way. Enjoy me. Is what God designed it to be like. And King Solomon is stepping into that and enjoying his wife. But through the enjoying, all the physicality of her, every single little bitty part that he's like, wow, that's amazing. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. He is showing that he cherishes her. Because the language that he uses, yes, it is language that is familial, familiar, not familial, that's two different things, familial and familiar, two separately different things. It's language that is familiar for beauty, but there is a depth to it because it is also covenantal language. I don't have have time 
to everything that's going on here. But he says that her eyes are like doves. And doves is what Noah releases on the ark to go out and find the land that God promised would be there. We could go on and talk about the other things, but he says her lips are like the scarlet ribbon. And the only other time in Scripture that the scarlet ribbon is mentioned is when Rahab drops it out of the window as an act of, I have faith that God is going to save me. All these terms that he is saying that says, yes, your body is beautiful, my beloved. Your whole body is beautiful, but more than that, you, your character, how God created you, reminds me of God's amazing covenant. It'd be like us coming to our spouse as we are enjoying who God has made them to be, to stand up and say, you know what? When I'm with you, I am reminded of the assurance of my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of the forgiveness of my sins. I'm reminded that God accepts me and he's going to call me home to be with him in eternity. How many of you said that when you're in the throes of passion? No, normally it doesn't come to mind. But that's what King Solomon is saying. He's saying, you are so amazing. God has blessed you so much. This is who I see in you, and this is how God shows me himself through you. What a statement that he's making. He's saying all that he values her and sees her character that high in addition to totally loving her body. Continues on. In Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 8 to 15, he says, Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Descend from the crest of Amana, from the top of Sinar, the summit of Hermon, from the lion's den and the mountain haunts of leopards. You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart. With one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace, how delightful is your love my sister, my bride, how much more pleasing is your love than wine and the fragrance of your perfume more than any spice. Your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna and nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with every kind of incense of tree, with myrrh and aloes and all the finest spices. You are a garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. Oh, he was a poet too. In verse 8, he calls her bride for the first time in the book. Before this, doesn't. It's beloved. Verse 8, they're now married, he says, bride. You can almost hear the tenderness in his voice when he says bride, and they're about to consummate the relationship. You'll notice several times he says, my sister, my bride. They were not related, okay? We'll just throw that out. They're not related, but it's in terms of endearment. In the Hebrew culture, a, a sibling was the closest relationship you could have. So he's saying, you're my bride, but you're also the closest relationship, I can have in this world is you and me. They're enjoying being naked together as God designed it. He created our bodies unique. God is glorified when you enjoy the uniqueness of each other's bodies, and he's admired her body from top to bottom, and now he is giving her an invitation. He says that she has stolen his heart. He professes his love to her again, saying that her love is worth more to him than anything else in the world or anyone else in the world. She is the only thing for her, him. And then he starts hinting to her at what he would like to do based upon his love. As he's staring adoringly at her naked body, he starts a hinting. And he says that her garden is locked up And he uses a rather provocative metaphor and speaks of her sealed fountain or well. In verse 15, he says, You're a garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. He doesn't want to force himself on her, but he asks her, because of their covenant and his love, to open up that well that he might go into the depths and how is she going to respond? Well, she doesn't respond like a normal blushing bride. 
Chapter 4, verse 16 says, Awake, north wind. Come, south wind. This is her talking. Blow on my garden that its fragrance might spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. They both understand that sex is something to be enjoyed, and when relished in the covenantal relationship, it is good, and God is glorified. So she looks at her husband, and she says, come on in. Let's worship God together through the passion of lovemaking. She throws himself at her and they, at him, and they consummate their marriage. And then King Solomon proclaims in verse 1, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I've gathered my myrrh with my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I've drunk my wine and my milk. They have consummated their marriage. They've had sex. And he says, wow, that was really good. And it was designed how God, it was how God designed it to be. They waited for the perfect moment and they came, became one in a gloriously pleasurable way. And then the chorus responds, eat friends and drink, drink your fill of love. Now it's not like there was a chivalry going on and all their friends are standing out doing all sorts of crazy noise making things and rejoicing in what's going on. That's not, that's not the Hebrew way. This is a retelling of what happened. And the friends at the retelling of what happened said, wow, that is great. And they're encouraging this new couple to enjoy the gift of sex that God has given, to drink their fill of lovemaking and not hold any passion back in their relationship. And in this, God is glorified. In this chapter, we see the care and the protection of the groom. How he seeks to love her and care for her throughout all this process, showing his love for her before he shows his passion. He, he's making sure that his beloved feels cherished and safe. You see the response of the beloved at the care and protection of her godly husband as she joyfully and ecstatically invites him in to enjoy the pleasures of marriage. You see the dance of oneness in this chapter, the mutual initiation and response of both, and finally, the joy of tasting the gift of God that had been guarded until the perfect time. The first night, chapter four. There's so much more we could talk about. But let's go in. I won't. I'll leave it as it is. We'll continue on chapter 5, not next week, because next week is Father's Day. And I won't preach chapter 5 on Father's Day. Just like we didn't preach Song of Solomon on Mother's Day, we're just going to take a little break, and it will be good. I will say, I forgot to tell you this during announcements, next week is Father's Day, in case you didn't know. Uh, and we're going to try to, we're going to have, we're going to have Sunday school on Father's Day, but we're going to try to get you out by noon, 12, 10, something like that. The service will be shorter. I'll preach a little shorter so Brooke can have a little shorter Sunday school as well, but not too short. Our goal, as we've been walking through Song of Solomon, to see what is going on in Song of Solomon, we show that, and then we take a break, and we talk about a defense of marriage, and I pick a different topic. We talked about the glories of sex for two weeks, and I really enjoyed it. And then last, uh, last week, we talked about procreation, children, how God designed marriage in order to have children, and to protect children, and to provide for children. And now, we're going to talk about intimate companionship. How God designed something really cool here in a marriage to have intimate companionship. I'm going to spend two weeks on this topic of intimate companionship. On the first Sunday in May, when I gave the introduction to the Song of Solomon, I declared that God designed marriage as a beautiful thing. Two different people, drastically different, not only in biology, but in emotions and desires and dreams. And these two people cut to come together, even though drastically different, to support one another, encourage one another, mature one another, and be completely devoted to one another, even if no one else in the world is. Marriage is truly a beautiful thing. When two people know one another closer than any other person in the world, and they hold that knowledge in safety and encouragement, my goodness. That is a relationship be to be treasured. And that is a relationship to be emulated across the world. When, when the world looks into a Christian family and sees a marriage that is this, it blows their mind. 
because they cannot fathom that sort of relationship. Unfortunately, many couples, even in Christian circles, do not experience the marriage that God designed them to have, the marriage that he is glorified when they have. In fact, instead of being someone who supports a husband or, or someone who encourages a wife or someone who matures a husband or someone who is completely devoted to a wife, showing safety and encouragement, the spouse is actually someone who is not safe, who regularly tears her husband down, who, who regularly abuses his wife, who is prideful and selfish. And so the marriage, instead of being this beautiful picture of God himself, is a painful experience and leaves a spouse with a feeling of hopelessness that nothing will ever change and they're stuck in this pain and misery for all the rest of their life. I'm fully aware that we live on this side of the fall, that we are all sinful, that we all intentionally or unintentionally hurt those closest to us. It is just part of who we are as broken, miserable sinners awaiting the grand redemption that God has in store for us in eternity. And sometimes we get stuck in our own thinking and we act the fool. Instead of seeking to understand the spouse that is before us, we say, I want my way, I want my belief, I am right, you're wrong. But one of the results of the gospel, if we have turned to Jesus in faith, is, yes, he saves us, he forgives us, he justifies us, he does all those things. But one of the results of our salvation is that we get to show people a picture of what life was like before the fall, a taste Not a perfect thing, not a perfect picture. It's smeared, a couple cracks in it. But it's a picture of life, what life was like before the fall in Eden. And we get to show people a taste of what life will be like when Christ comes again in paradise. When they look at us and we seek to glorify God in our relationship with our spouse. So you might be experiencing the pain of sin in your relationship if you're married. You might be experiencing the effect of your own sin or the effect of your spouse's sin. But Jesus died not just to save us, but he died to redeem us and to redeem our relationships. So Jesus can redeem your relationship if you humble yourself and let him. The ideal that I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to describe may not be your reality, but it can be. Because this ideal is what God designed our relationships, our marriages to be, and he is actively working to call us to live that ideal now. And he is glorified in front of all creation when we seek to live that ideal, though imperfectly, it's still a taste. And he is glorified in it. God designed marriage to be a total knowledge of each other. I love the Hebrew idiom for sex. I should drink before I... I love the Hebrew idiom for sex. It is to know. It's an intimate knowledge. Adam knew Eve, and then they had a kid. Abraham knew Sarah, and then he knew her again and again and again and again and again and again, and then finally they had a kid. Isaac knew Rebekah. Joseph did not know Mary until after Jesus was born. Then Joseph knew Mary. The Hebrews had a betrothal period. It was a time of getting to know each other. You were basically had signed your name on the dotted line. You were covenanted together, but you were not married yet. So you had this betrothal time where you got to know each other, who you were, your quirks and your this, that, and the other thing, and you prepare for marriage, build a house, do all that sort of thing. Then finally, wedding happened, and they got to know each other more intimately than ever before. There is knowledge, and then there is knowledge. You see your spouse completely exposed, and you experience the deepest parts of them. Marriage is a total knowledge of each other. Every single part, the part you like, 
the parts you don't like. It's total knowledge physically, spiritually, emotionally. Every single thing, our personalities, our giftings, our quirkings, the good, the bad, the ugly, we get to know it all in marriage. Everything is laid bare before your spouse. Your spouse is to have total knowledge of you. As we tell our premarital couples, if you love someone, you're going to allow them to see your whole self, messy emotions and everything. Because marriage is supposed to be a total knowledge. On the flip side, if we love someone, we will seek to see their whole self. We allow our whole self to be seen. We seek to see their whole self. We're like King Solomon, rejoicing over the entire body of his bride. But not just the entire body, but rejoicing to know the emotions and the giftings, the desires, the spirit, the quirks of our spouse, and not being content with what we learned yesterday. We got the diploma from our spouse yesterday, I'm good. But realizing that they changed, what happened? Who is this person that woke up next to me? You're not the same one. Maybe you don't have the same experience I do but continually learning every single day who our spouse is and enjoying that knowledge. My sister is saying, I can't believe you said that from the pulpit. (laughs) I love walking through 1 Peter 3, verse 7 with men. Uh, it's an ad- the admonition of the verse is for men specifically, but the application can be applied across genders. P- Peter says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you by the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. For us to live in an understanding way, we must first seek to understand our spouse. We must. We must desire that total knowledge. We we can't be the fool. As the wise man says in Proverbs 18, fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Unfortunately, we're too often like the fool saying, I want you to understand me, and I'm going to talk until you will understand me, or else you'll leave the room, one of the two. But instead, whether we are husband or wife, we're to seek that intimacy with our spouse, that total knowledge. I want total knowledge of you. You want total knowledge of me because God designed it this way and he is glorified when we live according to what he designed. But this can be scary. It can be really scary. Growing up, we're trained to hold things in. We're trained not to let our emotions out. Don't let people know what we're truly thinking. Why? Well, because they're going to rip us apart if we do. They're going to ridicule us if we do. They're going to walk right over us if we do. So, as the song in Frozen says, don't let them know. Don't let them in. Be the good girl that you are always meant to be. Conceal. Don't feel. Don't let them know. I'll keep singing, but I won't. God designed marriage to be a union of two completely different people coming together to support one another, encourage one another, mature one another, and be completely devoted to one another, even if no one else in the world is. Marriage is not supposed to be like the school you grew up in. It's not supposed to be like the workplace you left 30 minutes ago. It's not supposed to be like the sinful family that you grew up in and experienced and is constantly talking to you in the back of the head of how you're, you're, you're supposed to act, but you know it's sinful. Marriage is supposed to be a picture of God himself. That means that we should be completely, totally safe to allow total knowledge of ourselves by our spouses. That's what it's supposed to be. When a wife is emotional, because of something that happened during the day or something that her husband may or may not have done. She should be safe in voicing those emotions without having us turn around and verbally slap them around or say, stop, that's not valid or that's not true or blah, 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 whatever things we throw at them. She should be safe in voicing those emotions. When she has desires or concerns or dreams, she should be safe in voicing them. 
We should be like King Solomon, and as he showed us in chapter 2 and chapter 1, meeting his beloved where she is at emotionally and loving her as she needs to be loved at that moment in time. We should be like Christ, dying to ourselves that our spouse might live. When a husband is discouraged or scared or weighted down by the pressures of responsibility, whether at home or at work, he should be safe in voicing those emotions, and those fears, and those concerns. When he has desires or dreams, he should be safe in telling them without having a wife saying, that won't work. What are you thinking? A real man wouldn't do that. The wife should be like the beloved seeing the man before her and validating who God has designed him to be and calling that up and raising it up, respecting him and lifting him up as the church respects and lifts up Christ. That's the image that's supposed to happen. Our total knowledge should be in safety. My niece said something really cute this week. I told her dad I was going to share it. She's four years old doesn't really like dogs, but she was walking around the house barking incessantly, not stopping. My brother was annoyed. He didn't say that, but I could tell through who he was talking that he was annoyed. And so he turns to, to his daughter and says, hey, uh, you know, what's your dog's name? And she thinks, she says, my dog's name's cute because she's cute. I'm like, well, that's nice because it's her. She's calling herself cute. And he says, well, hey, cute, will you stop barking because you might scare Arabella? And my niece thought for a little bit and said, you know, I love cute, so I'm not going to be scared. I love cute, therefore I love cute's barking. (laughs) Out of the mouth of babes. Wisdom comes. Total knowledge and safety. This is how married couples should treat each other. I love my spouse. Therefore, I love every single part of my spouse. Yes, they're sinful, but that's for God to take care of. I'm going to love my spouse. Total knowledge and safety. Total knowledge and safety and an encouragement Basically, the entire chapter of Song of Solomon 4 is King Solomon verbally affirming how he sees his beloved. And he goes into detail. Men, when is the last time you have stared at your spouse and you've detailed all the reasons that you are attracted to her physically? I won't ask you to answer that. (laughs) But if it's been more than a week, shame on you. I don't care how old you are either. You can still do it. It's important to encourage your spouse in who God made her to be. When was the last time you detailed all the reasons that you cherish your spouse because of her character or her actions? Sometimes we can get into the routine of things where we go to work, we go to the farm or the ranch, and we get all the tasks done, and we come back and we're still in that task-oriented thing of all the things that have to get done in the house and the food we have to eat and the time going to bed, and all of a sudden we're asleep on our chair, TV going. And sometimes throughout that, we need to put the brakes, put the wrench in the gears so something goes, and we look at our spouse, and we list five things on how much we appreciate their character and what they do. If we have total knowledge in safety, we should be proving that we know our spouse and that they're safe with us by how we encourage them in who they are and in what they do. It should be our goal if we want to have the marriage that God has called us to have. Woman, you're not off the hook. When was the last time you detailed all the reasons that you are attracted to your husband if you're married? When was the last time? 
We think, do you ever think that, you know, if a guy is attracted to a girl physically, he'd probably also like his girl to be attracted to him physically too? And so tell him. It might be awkward for you. But do it. And it's good. When was the last time you detailed all the reasons that you respect your husband for his character and his actions? Men, God designed us with an invisible bone called the respect bone. Just like God designed women with a little bone called the love and cherishing bone. And just as we are supposed to show love, as Ephesians chapter 5 says, to our spouse, so wives are supposed to show that respect to the husband. An amazing thing happens when it, happen, when it does. An amazing thing happens. We lift our heads up, and we're able to do the work that God has called us to do that much better. We're able to do the ministry that God has called us to do that much better when we have that person there showing that respect, lifting us up. If you, a husband or wife, don't know any reason to cherish your wife or respect your husband, talk to me, and I'll walk with you through some things. I'll give you some reason, because the thing is, we are commanded, husbands are commanded to love their wife, and wives are commanded to respect their husbands, and we are not supposed to allow any sinful nature or misguided so-called spirituality to get in the way of obeying God. The interesting thing is, as I said, when a man cherishes his bride, or when a woman cherishes or respects her husband, they have an easier time performing their God-given roles. They have an easier time performing their ministries and callings in all areas of life if they know that at home there is someone who encourages them, respects them, cherishes them, and is devoted to them no matter what, no matter if anyone else in the world is. This one's on their side. We get to be our partner's cheerleaders so that we can each follow God through what he's given us. But we don't just get to be their cheerleaders to them, to their face. We get to be their cheerleaders to others. Throughout the Song of Solomon, the beloved is continually boasting about her love to her friends. He's ne she's never talking her beloved, her, her betrothed, or her husband down. Never is. So when we're with others, because we know our spouse, total knowledge, total knowledge, but it's supposed to be in safety. So when we're with others, we need to keep that safety. All that sinfulness we know, lock it up, put a key, throw it away. We are to be talking our lovers up, showing respect and love to them by how we speak to others. And God is glorified such amazingly when that happens. And the world around looks at us and says, what the deal is? We know who your husband is. We know who your spouse is. And we get to say, yeah, but I want to glorify God. And I am devoted to this person more than anyone else. And so I'm not going to talk bad about them to you, and you can't ever talk bad about them to me. Because they're mine. They're mine, and I want to show God to them. Now, I know that some don't have the total knowledge and safety type of relationship yet. And that cannot be created overnight. Don't expect it to. Don't expect it to. Next week, we're going to discuss how we can get there. Not next week, two weeks. Because we're taking a break for Father's Day. But chapter 5 in Song of Solomon, something happens. There's a rift in their relationship, and they've got to work through it. And so we're going to talk about that in two weeks and how to work through these issues so we can have total knowledge and safety. If you'd like help getting there, because that sermon's not going to be enough, let me know. But know that's going to take humility on both sides of the relationship. One person can't come and say, I want my spouse fixed. They've got to have the humility to say that I need to be fixed help me. And the other spouse needs to say, help me. And if one spouse doesn't have that, pers that, that perspective, it's not going to work. But you can fix your own side of the street and live godly yourself. And I can help you with that, even if the whole marriage isn't going that way. Will you pray with me? Father, 
thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are the God who looked in our sinfulness and said that you wanted a relationship with us. And in spite of our sinfulness and our brokenness, you reached down and did it all to restore that relationship and you're continually showing your love for us. You're continually pursuing us and lifting us up even though we don't deserve it. Lord, help us to show that to our spouse. Help it to show us to show that to our Christian community. May we show you that the world around might be compelled by the picture of you to follow you themselves. Thanks, Father. Amen.